and welcome to uh, Reflections on the Mass Election Victory in Bolivia. Um, if you're one of our regular viewers to these events, because we've done a few of them now, um, welcome back. We hope you're going to enjoy this talk that we've got um, ready for you. And if this is your first time attending one of our Alvarado events, we are um, an independent media platform with a focus on Latin American politics, music, culture, um, and we attempt to provide um, an alternative, more radical perspective on um, the Latin American region, which is often missing in the mainstream press, at least in the UK anyway. I'm Rachel Boothroyd and I'm a contributing editor at Alvarado, and I'm going to be um, moderating the rest of this talk. Um, so before we get to the interesting bit, which is our speakers, I'm just going to go through the, the structure of the whole event and how it's going to be organised. Um, so firstly, we're going to bring in our speakers and they're all going to share with us just briefly their thoughts on the significance of the mass or movement towards socialism election victory uh, in Bolivia and maybe some of the events leading up to that. Um, and then there'll just be a very um, informal kind of chat between myself as chair and the other speakers. And then we'll open the floor up to you guys um, for a Q&A session, which should last about 45 minutes. So if you do have a question uh, that you'd like to ask one of our speakers, then just pop it uh, in the chat box that hopefully everyone can see. I think the, the options on um, the bottom of your screen um, for the chat. So just pop your questions in there. Uh, just some house rules, please be comradely and respectful. Um, I'm sure I don't need to say that. And uh, also this is being filmed. So yeah, just bear that in mind. And if you don't want to, um, you know, if you don't want to appear, that's fine for those of you who are camera shy. Um, and it is going to be broadcast on Facebook as well. So it's totally up to you guys. Uh, you can keep your, your cameras off if you like. Um, so Last month we saw something really amazing in Bolivia, I think. Um, I think I can speak for all of us when we say that, when we saw that the, the movement towards socialism, the mass won the presidential uh, elections with what's now been confirmed as over 55% uh, of the vote. And that is a, you know, it's a tremendous landslide victory anywhere in the world, but I think particularly poignant in Bolivia right now, given what the country's been through over the past year. So, of course, these presidential elections came um, 11 months after a coup uh, led by the, you know, the police and the military in Bolivia um, on the tail end of mobilizations in the street led by the right uh, contesting the results of the uh, 2019 presidential elections. They alleged that there was um, basically that the winner of those elections, Evo Morales, um, who of course was the candidate of the mass at the time, had committed widespread fraud, uh, which I think a lot of us knew at the time and now we've, you know, we've been vindicated that that was uh, not the case and there was no evidence for that. And then since then we've had an extremely uh, awful period of time in Bolivia where we've had um, 11 months of government of uh, Chile Nanez, a lot of repression, repression of protesters, um, the killing of protesters. We've seen Evo Morales had to flee from the country uh, in fear of his life. Terrorist charges um, brought against him and um, yeah, just a really awful period. So I think um, last month's election victory was a huge surprise, not because we didn't expect the mass to win, but maybe a lot of us thought that free and fair elections uh, they didn't look likely to take place in Bolivia. So there's a lot of questions that have come out of this uh, and we've got some brilliant speakers with us today to kind of like get to grips with some of those questions. Um, so before I bring them in, we just wanted to show you a video of Luis Arce, uh, who's the president-elect in Bolivia. Um, and this interview was done by Redfish and it was done just before the, the elections. Um, but if we could just bring that video up, just to get a bit of context. Ahora democracia en el mes de noviembre del año pasado. Todo el mundo quiere controlar el litio boliviano. Todo el mundo quiere nuevamente negociar con el gas boliviano. Hay posibilidades de golpe de estado otra vez, sin duda alguna. Sigue habiendo los mismos intereses. Ha 
pasaron ya 11 meses y no tenemos ni democracia y peor, tenemos una economía absolutamente arruinada, quebrada y ha visto la gestión que ha habido, si se puede llamar así, en eh, estos 11 meses de gobierno de facto. La economía ha ido muy mal y no solamente por la pandemia, hay muchos más problemas en salud. Se muestra claramente que a este gobierno no le interesa a la derecha, no le interesa la educación porque estaban sacando un decreto supremo donde clausuran el año escolar porque no, no son capaces de llevar adelante la, el proceso educativo en pandemia, lo que muestra la total, la total incapacidad de administrar la economía, la salud, la educación en nuestro país y empiezan a cerrar ministerios claves como el Ministerio de Culturas y, y otros. Hay problemas, hay problemas serios que la población se ha dado cuenta de lo que es estar bajo un gobierno del movimiento del socialismo, donde había progreso, desarrollo, empleo, crecimiento y todo ello, versus un gobierno de derecha donde no se tiene nada de eso y más bien lo único que se tiene son problemas. Cuando tenemos una derecha desesperada y ellos han gastado muchísimo dinero para financiar el golpe de Estado que vivimos en noviembre del año pasado. Entonces está claro que no van a, no van a querer soltar rápidamente y de manera muy fácil entre los intereses. So that was just um, a brief part of an interview with Luis Arce, who's soon to be inaugurated as president in Bolivia. So um, hopefully that's enough context for people, but I'm sure that our speakers are going to. Um, expand a lot on what we've heard already so um uh, without further ado i'll introduce them so today we have olivia arigo styles who is a phd candidate studying histories of indigenous struggle in bolivia she is also a contributing editor of alborada magazine and she publishes widely on uh, latin american politics and culture and she was living in la paz at the time of the coup last year so welcome olivia um, we've also got Dennis Rogotayuk, journalist, researcher and international editor of El Ciudadano and the editor of Jacobin America Latina. He was the correspondent for El Ciudadano in the Bolivian elections last year and also an electoral observer there. So that will certainly be an interesting uh, perspective to hear from Dennis. And we have Oli Vargas, who is a reporter at Causatun News, um, which is uh, without a doubt one of the most important media outlets to have covered events in Bolivia over the last year um, so if you haven't followed them uh, please do. Um, Oli can we could we start with you um, would you be able to just give us your thoughts on you know what happened last month and the significance of the of the electoral result? Yes Oli thanks for having me I hope you can hear me okay. Yeah. Okay fantastic. Well, yeah, uh, obviously the, the victory there was of the movement towards socialism uh, on the 18th of October was extraordinary for a number of reasons. Obviously, because the mass as an organization for a whole year has been persecuted uh, with the aim of sort of wiping it out of existence. It's mainly this jailed, given criminal charges, uh, supporters sort of massacred, threatened. And so there was an attempt to destroy the organization. However, that didn't happen. Why? Because the movement towards socialism is more than just, you know, a party of individuals. It's more than just a sort of a, an association of like-minded people. Well, this is a coalition of the country's main social movements that has a physical presence in every single region of the country, particularly in the rural areas, rural indigenous areas, but as well, particularly in the working class areas of the big city. So, however, you know, if it was a party along the lines of, you know, the European Social Democratic Party, the whole organization would have collapsed when the persecution starts. But then they have uh, many people you persecute, you can't, uh, you can't do away with the movement of millions of people who join the party not as individuals, but as uh, collectives going in to, to form a political instrument. Because that's how the movement towards socialism was built. It was again, it was a party, but as a political instrument of the social movements in Bolivia. It came out of the struggles, particularly in the Tropic of Cochabamba, uh, which is where I'm based. I'm not there right now, I'm in the city of Cochabamba, but in the Tropic of Cochabamba, there was a huge struggle against the presence of the US military, 
of the DEA of USA, led by um, by Evo Morales in the 90s uh, when he was a union leader. And out of that struggle, Evo Morales was the person, which is why he's a, he's the the historic leader of Bolivia's social movement and is still a leader today. He was the one that pushed the idea that you know. The struggle, the indigenous struggle, has to move out, has to move beyond just not talking about, oh, well, you know, we've suffered this injustice, this, this like, river in our community has been contaminated, oh, you know, this, like, this company has done this bad thing in our land, you know, let's bring together some Western NGOs and some people to try and to help us solve this problem. No, we need to move beyond that from the union struggle into the political struggle. And the only way that we resolve problems that we face locally is by taking power at a national level, governing ourselves. Um, you know, not there's been any number of parties in Bolivia with good politics, left-wing parties, socialist parties, uh, communist parties. They've come to say, you know, we'll be the ones to represent you. We could, we'll be the vanguard. But the whole reason in which the mass creators no, we need to represent ourselves, we need to build an instrument that reflects the social movements that will bring us to power. And I think that's a very special political model and I think it's something that can teach people around the world. And so of course the election is a vindication of that political model of organization of taking, strengthening the social movements and then launching that into a political struggle. It also shows that the um, you know, obviously, we're talking here to, to those in the UK, in, in the English-speaking world. And I think in the English-speaking world, in academia, there's been a long tradition of talking about uh, Bolivia. Well, not about the whole of the Latin American left. Is, oh, well, you know, there's the mainstream left, the pink tide left, and then there's the sort of more independent left, social movements that don't want to be co-opted by the state. I think particularly, you know, writers like Jeffrey Weber talked about Bolivia, talking about, oh, you know, I support the independent movements, you know, being co-opted by the state is a bad thing. It shows that all of that, all of that discourse around, uh, you know, independent left was an invention in the, it was a fantasy of Western academics that wanted to impose their own sort of sect way of thinking onto Bolivia. In Bolivia, there is no left outside the movement towards socialism. The movement towards socialism is a coalition between of the rural indigenous social movements, the working class movements in the big cities, as well as the traditional left and the more sort of un, uh, unorthodox, you could say, uh, sections of the Marxist left. So within the mass you have, who endorsed the mass, you have the Communist Party of Bolivia, the official mm -hmm. Communist Party of Bolivia, uh, who are not members of the mass, but who were part of the electoral campaign were there at all the election rallies backing the mass. And of course, within the mass itself, you have figures such as Alvaro Garcia Linera, such as Luis Arce himself, who come from a sort of Marxist intellectual background, but who sort of from unorthodox traditions, moving away from the sort of old Communist Party lines or old Trotskyist lines that were common, that used to be common in Bolivia during the Cold War. And people like Luis Arce, before he came, went into politics, he held, he had a, he was well known for running sort of Marxist study circle based around economics about how you can build post neoliberal economies. And uh, that's the sort of circles, very, very different, diverse social circles. Obviously, that circles of Marxist intellectuals drawn from the middle class, but they formed the coalition with, uh, as I said, the rural indigenous movements and the workers' movements in the cities. So it shows the way, the powers in which coalition building can have in politics and not just building, you know, a unit that, that then afterwards goes out to, uh, to different people around the country and tells them I'm going to be the one to represent. No, the Bolivian model is to social means building instruments to represent themselves. Yeah, I think, that, that's... Uh, going Very forward, good. sorry, going forward... Yeah, yeah. The challenges are, are numerous, obviously. Although the victory is overwhelming, already we've seen huge outbreaks of violence in the city of Santa Cruz, where there's currently around 40 point roadblocks in the city, sort of people mm -hmm. uh, blocking key roads. 
there's 40 points for that in the city. If here in Cochabamba, in the city, there's around 10, 12, uh, and one of their leading members of these sort of far right groups that have continued the violence, one of those groups that are called the Resistencia Juvenil Cochala. Yesterday, one of their leaders was arrested. They are holding explosives, including nail bombs, uh, gas grenades, tear gas, military jackets. You gotta ask, where do these people get these sorts of equipment? Uh, these aren't DIY things. These are groups that have been coordinating with the state for the past year. So those groups are still active. And that could be a, a stress here of the outgoing government to try and reactivate those groups to destabilize the country as Luis Arce takes power. So we have to be very, very concerned about that. It's not over yet. The coup, the violence of the coup is certainly still ongoing. Another challenge is, of course, the economic crisis. Bolivia went from being the fastest growing economy in South America under Evo Morales to then uh, a year of economic crisis in the country. So it's, uh, it's, it's incredibly There's difficult. kind of a lot to unpack and a lot to get through, definitely. Um, yeah, that's, you know, um, I think that's such an important point, what you said, which might have escaped um, some people that it's not just a testament to kind of like the electoral um, or even the leftist project in Bolivia under the mass, but a testament to, you know, how much um, of the masses, you know, depends on its social movement base and their durability in the face of um, repression. Um, I definitely want to get to this this issue over kind of what we can expect from the right, because I don't think any of us are expecting the right just to go, OK, fine, you guys have won fair and square. Um, but before we do, maybe we'll just bring in some of our other speakers. Olivia, would you mind if we just go to you so I can just get your thoughts kind of on the election um, as well? Yeah, um, thanks for having me. And also it's great to be no, talking, at this talking at this juncture, uh, which is obviously vastly more hopeful than our last Alborada event on Bolivia, when Bolivia was kind of in the midst of, of what was a very devastating human rights and political crisis. I think a year ago, it would um, it would have been almost impossible to predict that Bolivia would be here today with a new mass government having won a landslide election victory. And I think all the more surprising, given that in these you know in the run up to these elections in Bolivia, many commentators were speculating about what a post mass Bolivia would look like. You know, kind of this assumption that the mass was you know had kind of reached its sort of its conclusion point as a as a political project. But instead, obviously, with the election of Luis Arce and the elections a few weeks back, Bolivia has entered, hopefully, what is a, I think, a new chapter of, uh, of, of peace, of civility, but also, yeah, prosperity, justice for Bolivia's poor, for its workers, campesinos, uh, and indigenous and, and feminist movements. Um, and I think these elections really represent, um, firstly, the end of the the distinct project launched by right, these right-wing elites in the political crisis of 2019. For 14 years, the mass has been in power and the, the right has been unable to form a solid support base outside pockets in, in particularly urban centers in, in Santa Cruz and, uh, and the Media Luna region. They tried in 2008 to launch a coup, they failed. They succeeded in 2019, but failed to, to really entrench a support base. Um, and under Janine Añez, they've repeatedly tried, as, as Oli has, has mentioned, through legal circumvention, but also through extrajudicial violence to, to block the return of the mass, to prevent um, figures running on, on, you know, for, for, for in the election. Evo Morales obviously wasn't able to run for president, but um, also wasn't able to run as, you know, as a senator. Um, so they tried to annihilate the mass as a, a viable political force and, and they failed. And I think, um, you know, why was this? Well, firstly, the right wing simply had very little to offer the majority of Bolivians. And this was exposed through successive corruption scandals, economic mismanagement, and a disastrous handling of, of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, Bolivia is one of the worst affected countries in the world from coronavirus. Um, and they failed more crucially, I think, to capitalize on middle-class discontent, which emerged I think it's fair to say in the years after 2016 with the referendum and reached a zenith in the coup of 2019. And this year, as, as Oli has said, you know, political persecution has happened, corruption, the purchase of ventilators from a, a Spanish firm at vastly inflated prices, uh, at the peak of the coronavirus pandemic, 
all of this really undermines the credibility and legitimacy of the of the right. Um, and of course, you know, coronavirus it hit the poorest hardest. Those who couldn't work because of quarantine weren't able to 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 eat. And most Bolivian workers are in the informal economy and more vulnerable to economic vicissitudes. So I think what we've seen over the past year is the, the right revealing themselves, you know, they took power, but they were a government of the mega rich who are plundering the resources of the state, enriching themselves at the expense of the people, which is a very old story in Bolivian politics. And that's something that the mass was a repudiation of way back in 2005. But of course, this doesn't explain, you know, the appeal of the mass in a kind of positive way and why the mass was able to harness the support of the majority of people. And as Oli has, has outlined, the mass is not a traditional party in the Western sense. It's not, you know, this kind of, it's, 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 a, it's a collective, it's a political expression of indigenous campesino movements, of the workers movement. Um, and it's forged from these pacts of unity. It's a kind of conditional support drawn from various sectors the Peasant Confederation, Sesutsupe, the Bartolinas, um, the, the COB, obviously the major trade union federation, and the Coco Growers, um, which is where you know, Morales himself obviously comes from. And I think these social movements really um, mobilized in earnest this year in recognition of the threat to, to sort of democracy more broadly by this unelected neoliberal government, um, which was repeatedly you know, um, repeatedly postponing elections, but also the various kind of specific policies as well. I think, you know, the, the um, decree which expanded GM seeds generated a lot of consent, discontent from the agrarian, popular agrarian sector. But more fundamentally, the groups, the social movements mobilized because they perceived a, an existential risk from the discriminatory language of the regime, from this virulent current of racism from, from the right-wing elites, who, which came out in the efforts to demonize the mass, language that talked about savage Indians returning to power. And this, of course, invoked old, you know, older struggles going back throughout the 20th century and earlier by indigenous peoples to, to shape um, their relationship with the state and to, um, to challenge the racism of ruling elites. Um, and one thing just sort of additionally as well, I think that one thing that's changed perhaps in, in the mass in, in the kind of the space that opened up as Morales um, in his absence, in, you know, with Garcia Lenero, or, you know, this kind of space that opened up, we've seen fresh, a fresh leadership, new, a new generation, which have, has acquired new prominence. Um, so, I mean, Andronico Rodriguez, the Coca Growers, head of Coca Growers Union, obviously now president of the Senate. Um, Adriana Salvatierra, who's not new, but it has kind of come to the fore in recent months. So I think, yeah, so I think this electoral victory is explained um, by all of these factors, but really which kind of show a revitalized party, a reinvigorated social base. And that is, I think, how we understand the victory of the mass. Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. And I think that's one of the main questions or kind of doubts, at least in the academic world, which Ali was talking about, that's been levelled against, you know, the Latin American left, you know, oh, it's, it's Cali Yismo, there's, you know, these mm -hmm. strong leaders, who's going to replace them? And so it's really kind of amazing to see what, you know, you're saying this year is given, on the one hand, it's been really repressive, and there's been this attempt to kind of close the mass down as political force, but on the other hand, there's been an opening up and a flourishing within the mass, and um, bringing forward new leadership. So that's kind of contradictory, but, but also really fascinating. Um, Dennis, can I get your thoughts on, on this? Um, because it was a huge victory. Um, were you expecting a victory? Were you expecting a victory this big? You know, what were, what are your thoughts? First of all, thanks, uh, Rachel, for organizing this. Thanks to Alvarada. And it's a great, uh, it's great to finally share the space uh, with the other two comrades, with, uh, with Olivia and, and with uh, Oliver here. Um, I would say that this is not. This was definitely unexpected. This level of uh, uh, this kind of award, this kind of a result uh, for Mars, uh, as this this was, this was also based on a. This was also based on a kind of a research and investigation which I did prior to the elections, where I 
uh, where I basically an anal analyzed about a dozen different factors under which you know this kind of election was going to be was not something that I would have we would have expected to be f uh, free, fair, balanced, and uh, and legitimate. In fact, in fact, a prior in the run up to the to the election, it was uh, it was becoming sort of kind of more and more obvious that um, or uh, or it was becoming more and more likely that uh, there would actually be um, uh, yes. There would there would be fraud of uh, you know a certain certain size and sort of a certain measure, but against mass. And this isn't this uh, wasn't just talking about uh, you know the the classic uh, the classical methods which which have been utilized by the right in the rest of Latin America, like in places like Honduras, uh, for example, where there was, where there was outright um, you know the staff, the stuffing of, of of ballot papers. Uh, in, in the in the in the polling in the polling station in the um, and and whatnot some sort of the classic methods uh, for voter fraud but also of course the atmosphere that has been created in the last eleven months so the atmosphere of violence of repression of intimidation against mass against its leadership against its voters a huge a massive media campaign waged constantly by the private media by the by the state owned media uh, uh, as well the you know the amount, the amount of uh, sort of false false news and uh, character assassination attempts that were waged uh, with the with the help and assistance of, uh, of far right extremists uh, from Spain, um, uh, and uh, of course uh, also uh, also uh, attempts uh, successful sometimes not successful at, at actual political persecution of of the various leaders of the various uh, uh, of the various candidates so actually attempting to elim uh, attempting to eliminate as many of the the most promising candidates from the electoral lists similar to what they've been doing uh, in ecuador uh, and the list goes on there's also of course actual violence being perpetrated against uh, mass supporters on, on the street by by the para paramilitaries so in this uh, in this in these kinds of circumstances, no, it was it was it was very hard to to expect uh, a free and fair election, much less an outright uh, mass victory. So when I so whenever I am actually seeing the the new right wing, uh, well, sorry, uh, the, the old the old right wing uh, implement, uh, trying to trying to start up a sort of a new campaign of uh, suggesting that there's been fraud in these elections, then well, I would say in a way they are right. But except that, except that the fraud was except the fraud was done against against mass under a normal kind of circumstances. If um, if mass was allowed to be was allowed to be campaigned in the same way that the right wing was allowed to be campaigned without intimidation, with a fair space uh, mm -hmm. uh, across across the media, without this these kinds of constant you know, tax and pressure done against them, then uh, the vote of mass would probably be closer to two thirds. Mm. That's huge. Uh, similar the, the to the right wing actually lost votes, did they not? At least the the main kind of um, um, Comunidad Ciudadana, they went down by like five hundred thousand votes. Is that right? Well, yeah, well, where, yes, where, yes. Where have those votes gone? Is kind of my it's, question. It's uh, well, well, actually, it was quite 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 interesting what happened to the right wing uh, vote, and uh, I'm I actually acquired. Uh, uh, I, I acquired sort of several um, data analytics um, pages, pages here, which I hope to demonstrate that. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure if I would be able to uh, actually show it. Now, these um, these I acquired from um, uh, from a William da data analysts, uh, and so these are th that's, this is literally the data based on the OEP. Um, the organo electoral, uh, the um, the electoral, the main electoral organ of Bolivia. So this one, so these we've got three three maps that actually show the first one uh, where the where the or where the votes came from for both mass and the right uh, overall right wing candidates. Mm -hmm. um, and these are these are quite, quite similar to what the, to the electoral maps that, that we've seen in. Uh, in the rest of uh, uh, in the rest of the media, so we, we saw that you know mass very much sort of rec rec reclaiming uh, the Altiplano region of um, 
of the western side of Bolivia, uh, all the way for, all the way from the north, uh, Pando, all, uh, down south to uh, to Sucre and to uh, to Potosi. <coughs> Uh, while the rights, well, but but also some major regions in uh, in in Santa Cruz, the rural regions of Santa Cruz, uh, there. I think this, the second map shows. Yes, uh, this, the, this, so this this map actually shows what happens to the right wing boat, more specifically to the boat of uh, of Comunidad Ciudadana or to Carlos. So Carlos just, just to explain maybe that alliance to some people because I think there was, I'm not 100% on it, but Agnes was going to stand, then she withdrew and said it was necessary to get behind this alliance, mm. which is led by Carlos Mesa. And that's kind mm. of like the centre right, uh, so I'm not sure if I'm translating it right, but citizens kind of coalition, kind of their centre right, is that correct? Right. Yeah. Uh, well, yes, well, effectively, effectively the, um, <coughs> He presented, uh, uh, Messi basically present, presented himself in this election similar to the way he presented himself in 2019 as a kind of a, as basically as a centrist candidate of, uh, of some kind. Well, still caring, but still, still carrying the same neoliberal uh, pol economic policies that he himself implemented when he was president of, uh, of Bolivia, when he was the vice president of Bolivia under, under the presidency of um, uh, Gonzalo Sanchez de Lozada, or uh, or Goni, and he, you know, there was a, there was a concentrated, concentrated campaign in the last uh, few weeks of the election to actually uh, ensure to actually, to actually try to uh, uh, get the get the right wing united uh, around one single candidate. In this case, it was Carlos Mesa. So, for for a long time, uh, uh, Mesa was considered to be like this uh, the useful vote. So to speak, mm -hmm. of the rights, you know, the one, the one person who, who, who stood an actual chance of, um, of, ex of preventing mass from winning in the first round, and then quite possibly, uh, you know, beating a mass candidate in the second round. But as we know, uh, that di that didn't happen. So, so the uh, even though even though uh, Janine Agnes st stood down her candidacy, and that that did assist Carlos Mesa. Right, because um sorry Rach, could you uh, bring up the map the map again yeah. yeah could is there any chance we can get the map up again just have a quick look yeah, this one yes uh so we so we see the um and, in the region of the, the boats for the alliance aren't they, they kind of yes yeah, so, so 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 the green illustrates where Carl's, where the vote for Carlos Mesa increased and the purple is where it decreased so the region of benny so that's uh, the um <laughs> Um, the home state of Janine of Agnes, Janine uh, we can see that, uh, that no, the vote, the vote there increased quite substantially compared, mm -hmm. compared to last year. So yeah, her standing down with candidacy definitely gave him a boost, but uh, whatever boost he could have received from Agnes, it was taken away, mass, it, was, it was taken away by uh, the votes which he, um, uh, which he lost to the far right candidate in Santa Cruz, uh, Fernando Camacho. And in Santa Cruz there, in the, um, Eastern part of the country, uh, we can see a lot of purple dots, especially in um, well in the rural areas, but also, but mostly in the uh, in the city in the city of Santa Cruz, um, being re being reduced. And these these are uh, the ones the ones in the city are the ones he lost to Camacho, and the ones in the rural more in the rural areas are the ones he lost to to Mas. So overall, there was a, a complete failure on the on the part of a uh, of the right wing to actually decide if there would be uh, a a coalition agreement of any of any kind to even just get over the electoral tr th uh, threshold to you know you know to beat mass in the election and much less about you know formation of any government in the future. Oli, can I just bring you back in to talk a bit about? Um... Obviously, there's this alliance of the right, um, which came in second place, but the right is split, is it not, as far as I understand it? Um, you know, I don't want to call them a, right, a mainstream kind of right, because they're still led by pro-coup, um, you know, racist politicians, but there's an even more fundamentalist right, is that correct, um, led by uh, Luis Camacho. And I'm just wondering, he actually managed to translate 
some of his support into you know into votes and also um i think he even got seats in the senate and chamber of deputies and i'm just wondering what's what's behind that does this mean that the the movement that's been led by camacho up until now which i think has been violence in the streets does that mean that they're moving towards more of a political kind of organization or you know what can we expect to see here yeah i think the the phenomenon of camacho is is, is very interesting and um something i think over the years of, of mass government could benefit the the mass because it it leaves the right divided on sort of cultural and ideological terms so Camacho represents the, the oligarchy in the east of the country in Santa Cruz, which is, uh, you could say historically, is sort of nouveau riche, is they're very thuggish, racist, violent, whereas the sort of bourgeoisie represented by Carlos Mesa in the west of the country, in La Paz, in the Andean areas, that is is a is a more traditional bourgeoisie, you know, dating back to the Spanish. And they see themselves a lot more liberal, a little more civilized, um, they, they view Camacho as brutish, and so that's, that's that divide between the West and the East has always been there, and now it's become formalized organizationally. And the first words of Camacho after the elections was to show that that's how he plans to move forward. He said, Well, for the first time, Santa Cruz has a party, and that's how he sort of framed the fact that he lost in the rest of the country. But one big in Santa Cruz, as they said, from this moment forward, we are the party of Santa Cruz. And that leaves the right divided in cultural terms. That's very good, I think, for the mass. What is dangerous, I think, is that Camacho has maintained his sort of really extremist sort of position. He was part of the coup, obviously. He was the person who led the street mobilizations before the coup that destabilized the country, allowing the military to intervene. He then sort of was able to participate in the new government. He was given, his allies were able to go in certain places, state industries, certain ministries. But when the government, and certainly the US embassy, saw him as a sort of loose cannon, as someone who's unreliable, a bit of a thug, they, they pushed him out. Within a couple of months, he was pushed out of government completely. Uh, and so he took on this even more radical position. Saying, I'm the real sort of right wing populist. I'm against the mass and I'm against this new sort of establishment right as well. And that's how he ran his election campaign. And it's on that basis that he won in Santa Cruz. And now he's, uh, what he's doing now, he's calling for the civic committee of Santa Cruz, civic committees of the main right-wing coalition of big business interests. His party is now calling for them to hold um, sort of a, a mass rally, a mass assembly, where, you know, where they would decide to hold a paro civico, which is mass protests in the streets against the mass taking power. So they've taken, they've maintained their extremist position, but now they've got a certain institutional backing. So that's quite dangerous. But as long as the mass can sort of keep them isolated, then it could benefit long term, I think. But um, yeah, the, 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 the right in Bolivia is poorly developed, poorly developed politically, and this now cultural and ideological division can be seen. So is Camacho, I mean, just to get an idea of how right radical he is, is, does he have links to kind of, you know, I personally read that he's got links to kind of fascist movements, Nazi parties, is that, you know, what's his background in terms of that? Yeah, absolutely. The, the Civic Committee of Santa Cruz is a coalition of big business interests. But they have a youth wing, youth section called the Union Juvenil Cruzanista, which is quite traditionally fascist organization uh ideologically also in practice they're the ones at the moment going around uh yeah attacking people for not joining their, their roadblocks attacking people trying to pass through their roadblocks they mobilize violence behind a political interest which is a kind of traditional uh sort of formula for a fascist or fascist movement party however you want to call it um so yeah, the structures are certainly all there in Santa Cruz, in Cochabamba here in the city. There's the beginnings of that with this group, the Resistencia Juanil Cochala. They're much smaller, um, less tradition, less long-standing than the people in Santa Cruz. They've been going for decades and decades with a traditionally fascist ideology. The ones in Cochabamba are mostly sort of 
street criminals, ex-gang members, that, those sorts of people. So there's, it's still something that's in the process of organising, but they are just as violent. So I think, what, what are these groups going to do when the mass takes power? They're already talking, saying that there's electoral fraud. That's how they explain the fact that they lost the elections. How can there be electoral fraud, you know, done by the mass when the whole elections were organised by a right-wing government that's tried to persecute the mass out of existence? It's obviously an absurdity, but it's the words that they're using to try and destabilise the country once again. So I hope the world sort of supports Bolivia if this carries on, supports Bolivia in combating these sorts of fascist groups and putting an end to this once and for all. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for that, um, Ollie. Olivia, just talking about um, the mass coming to power, um, obviously Ollie's talked about what we can kind of expect from the right, you know, this sense of this is not over. Um, what can we expect from the mass government now? Obviously there's this new leadership which you talked about before. Um, what direction um, or what has the mass indicated in terms of the direction that it's going to take now that it's once again in power? Will, will there be any recriminations for the people who've, who've you know, who've led the coup and also what, what are they hoping to pursue in terms of policy, do you think? Yeah, um, well, I think it's, it's, I guess, slightly too early to say if there's going to be some decisive break in kind of the, the Arce regime compared with previous years under Morales, but I think um, I think there are indications that Arce will continue to stay broadly true to the kind of what you might call the core ethos of the mass. But I think we can expect in some ways perhaps a new programme. Um, so Arce has said Morales won't have any role in the government. Obviously he's trying to distance himself from, from Morales. He said uh, we are mass 2.0 in an interview before the elections. And he's talked about overcoming our errors. So clearly, again, this is probably electoral strategy. He's keen to stress that the mass and its leadership has reflected on criticisms that did come out of um, in 2019 and the years prior to that. And that he's preparing to enter government, I think, with a new humility, a new responsiveness, a commitment to participatory decision making. And this, we see this kind of echoed by other um, leaders like Eva Copper, for example. Um, in terms of, I think, sort of distinct policy areas, I mean, um, in one of his economic plan, Arce talked about uh, trying to overcome the, the economic crisis that is looming through investment in biodiesel, for example. Um, obviously, things are, you know, as we've sort of heard, you know, that there is an economic crisis coming. Um, unemployment is, is going to, in, has increased considerably. Uh, foreign reserves are dwindling gas, natural gas, the major sort of driver of the Bolivian economy um, is, is not bringing in the, the, the revenue now as it did before. So one sort of way to, to get around that is yeah, investment in biodiesels. Of course, this could, uh, you know, I mean, this, this may well work in, in, economically, but I mean, one thing to say is that it does sort of open up the government to a renewed criticism on, on perhaps environmental grounds in terms of biodiesel, it's very environmentally destructive. It may lead to more deforestation. Um, this is perhaps not the priority maybe for the government obviously in, in, in an economic crisis they need to perhaps they'll prioritize that but it is worth sort of noting that some of the criticisms in 2019 were exacerbated by the devastating fires in Chikatania of course actually fires have increased this year since the coup government took power 40 percent I think extra, in additional fires across uh, Chikatania but also parts of um, the east so, um, so yeah, we, we, we might expect perhaps more, more criticism coming from that front um, in terms of deforestation, which has increased drastically in the past uh, five years. So I think it's, it's an interesting sort of dynamic because obviously when Morales first came to power back in 2006, it, it was on, he, he was, um, I think, probably one of the first leaders on the world stage to really point the finger at at capitalism, at consumerism, at, at the global north for being the driver of the environmental crisis. And he made these incredibly radical statements about, about the environment. And we have seen the, the mass sort of backtrack from that and, and certainly deviate from, from those, those earlier radical statements. Um, yeah, so I think that's, yeah, that's what I would say. That's what you'd say the direction is going to be. I mean, that that kind of tension that you've just pointed towards between, you know, 
Morales in government um, and the kind of social movements upholding the mass um, who, you know, are committed to, um, you know, environmental um, causes, land protection, etc., which has sometimes been challenged by the masses kind of, um, or Morales's um, uh, public works and economic policy, etc. Um, is there not, would you say there's a, there's a strong mandate now for that, is there not? Or do you think that the, maybe in some of those indigenous groups, campesino groups have put aside their criticisms temporarily in order to get behind the mass and then will you know have that debate within the mass um once you know once Arce has taken power so can we obviously we're i think in the west we're used to kind of opposition politics whereas what happens a lot in latin america is this is you know people um social movements uh, the popular movement comes together for an election puts aside differences but then we'll have these very brutal internal debates about the direction um that the government should take so can we expect to see kind of more of that internal debate do you think i mean i think these tensions have always existed in you know over the past 14 years and of course it's worth saying that you know i mean indigenous groups are certainly not uh, you know, homogenous, they have different interests. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think this speaks to what Ollie was mentioning earlier about, it can be very frustrating in terms of reading, particularly sort of liberal left coverage of, of Bolivia. It, it, you know, there's this rhetoric around amplifying voices. So mm -hmm. to say, for, and this sort of, so, so where you bring in, say, you know, one indigenous group, uh, you know, and, and you say, look, they're, they're, they oppose Morales. Um, and All in actually, it, it, it obscures the fact that to the majority of, of indigenous groups have kind of thrown themselves behind the mass project. So in that way, it kind of distorts or, or it seeks to, to obfuscate the actual dynamics on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, so let's go back. Yeah, so I think that these tensions have always existed. Um, but of course, for example, the one example that often is, is brought out in this is, is, is the tipness, which was um, something that Morales subsequently has said was a mistake, but it was, you know, an attempt to build a, a road through uh, protected land um, linking the Amazon and the Andes. Um, but it generated a huge amount of protest from, uh, from indigenous groups living in the region. But the flip side was there were a lot of you know groups in that area who who did want the road to to you know for, for economic development for infrastructure in what is an incredibly you know a, a poor country. So um, so yeah so basically these tensions have existed and and it's worth saying that the majority of the tipness in these elections voted for the mass the, mm -hmm. the residents uh, inhabitants. So yeah so I think we'll continue to see I mean the mass is a is a broad coalition and we'll continue to see kind of. These, these tensions around extractivism and environmental protection play out in future years. I mean, it's, I guess it's inevitable in a country like Bolivia, which obviously has a, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of bound by 500 years of history of, of extraction and it's very hard for developing countries to break out of that. Dennis, my, my question is, um, we've had a lot of um, talk, you know, in journalists and academic circles, Ali referenced it about kind of like the pink tide coming to an end, do you know, the, the ebb of the pink tide. Um, how significant is this, you know, in Bolivia, we've, we've, again, we've seen there's been a coup, um, very, very brutal right-wing coup, um, which, you know, a lot of countries, you know, you know, mentioned Honduras have never recovered from the kind of lawfare that have been, been used against them. Um, are we, you know, one, what does that say about this narrative that we've seen peddled around about the kind of, um, you know, the, 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 almost a feat of the pink tide and um, does it indicate some kind of resurgence of the left in, in power at least in Latin America because we've seen also in Argentina the soft left um, took power um, at the at the end of last year I think it was in elections if I've got that right um, yeah so what what do you think this means regionally for the for, for Latin America well, interestingly enough, uh, actually, one of the main one of the main interviews that I conducted in Bolivia last year, just prior to the elections, was with Alvaro Garcia Linera, uh, while he was still an exposed vice president. And the entire kind of topic of the of the interview was was that was that the the pink tide was not over. Um, the, but but he disagreed. Uh, Garcia Linera kind of disagreed on this thesis of uh, there being. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're being kind of, kind of tides. This, this, whole, this whole concept of there being a tide and then a drawback and then a tide. He always, you know, he kind of explained it in a way that's in, in kind of in, in, terms of, in terms of waves is that 
that whatever that in, in that each major kind of advance that has been made by the progressive governments in uh, in 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 Latin, in Latin America can't can't re, can can't really be um, I said pushed back pushed back fully you know even even if the, the wave kind of goes back a, a bit so sort of the next one the next one that's on its, no, then on its way will kind of advance will make even further advances than the one uh, than the one before mm -hmm. uh, so we we kind of speculated that um, the with the election of new of new left wing governments in uh, in Latin in Latin America what what, what we are not, what we are not really seeing is not, not really kind of the you know the the pink the same pink tide coming back but rather kind of a new wave of left wing and socialist uh, governments uh, now unfor unfortunately the in the case of Bolivia this 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 wave was actually was delayed by by one year because almost almost to the day by the emergence of uh, of the coup regime uh, as we know. Uh, but I would say that uh, in, 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 other, in other talks and other conversations that I've had uh, with, with other organizations and other comrades, uh, we, uh, one of the arguments that, I, that I've made is that you know this is actually the first time in modern history of Latin America where, whereby a left-wing government suffered, suffered, suffered a coup but was actually able then to quickly recover, recover power. Mm -hmm. um, now, some, uh, some comparisons can be made to Venezuela in 2002. Uh, 12th of the period between the 12th of April and the 14th of April, uh, but the coup, now, but the coup against Chavez never fully fully succeeded. So he was still, he was able to very quickly kind of, uh, regain power. Or, for example, to the situation in uh, Argentina in 1973, whereby the the progress movement came back to power uh, 17 years after. Um, after the coup against uh, uh, Juan Perón, but, but again, that's a, that's a very long stretch of time. Mm -hmm. So overall, there was, what is the most significant about the case of Bolivia is that this is the break of the of this vicious cycle that we've witnessed um, in the region, whereby there is a, a coup of some kind, you know, military, police, constitutional, parliamentary, uh, which which are one seems to be the most effective at at that time. So uh, left wing leader, left wing government is removed. There is an election. A right wing uh, party wins and uh, in, in begins implementing kind of auster austerity, privatization, neoliberalism, sort of the return to the old uh, to the old ways. And this is and this was broken in the case of in the case of Bolivia. So uh, the left actually coming coming back to power. Through democratic means, under an extremely tense uh, situation, this is this is kind of the real achievement of um, uh, of, the, of the victory of Mas, and definitely, I would say, with the uh, the victory of uh, Alberto Fernandez in elections in Argentina last year was actually no less significant because, as we know, Argentina played a massive Argentina together with Mexico played a huge role in uh, uh, saving the life of Eva Morales. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as well as uh, as well as providing refuge to uh, other other figures in the Evo Morales government, but also also being uh, you know countries uh, that, that that were opposed to what was what was taking place in Bolivia at the same time. And recently, uh, it was stated by Evo uh, that by Evo and some of the others is that there's an in, an intention to actually to rebuild the Union of South American Nations. <laughs> oh. Uh, between uh, together be between between Venezuela, uh, Bolivia, Argentina, uh, possibly also bringing in uh, Mexico. Although Mexico is as at the moment leading the efforts to maintain the the community of Latin American and Caribbean nations, so or CELAC. Uh, but this is uh, again certainly a huge boost for. Uh, yeah. The return to the integration of of Latin America, and just just one one last thing also also wanted to, to point out. This actually has to do with the, with what Olivia mentioned previously about the indigenous movements and how mm -hmm. you know some of them being opposed to to, to Morales, and then these figures being used you know, by the by the media to uh, to portray, you know to, to portray as Morales being somehow against the indigenous movements. There was one there's, there was one particular figure. In these uh, throughout this last 11, 11 months, who uh, an, indigenous, an indigenous leader 
who actually who's actually been actually became one of one of the fiercest critics of of, of Evo, who actually became one of the uh, most visible kind of opposition figures, if you could say that, within the indigenous movement against against Evo. His name is uh, Felipe Kichpe, or, but uh, most of the country knows him as uh, El Majku, or the well, the chieftain. And uh, who played a huge role in the organization of the uh, protests in August. And he himself, so he himself actually stated that he voted for us. So he, so he again, he, he again, we actually have a situation of um, indigenous leaders who may have been opposed to mass or were opposed to Evo returning to the returning to the fold, returning to uh, uh, to the movement towards towards socialism after once again understanding. What the true enemy is and what the real, uh, where the where the real real struggle is. So so once once again it is it's it's not. Uh, mass is the main indigenous and socialist force. It's almost like the whip of the counter revolution in a way. You know, kind of bringing people back on board and refocusing that struggle. Um, yeah, I mean, I could, I could go on all day asking questions because I've got loads, but I want to open it up to the people who've, who've asked. I don't think we've got Ollie back on as far as I can see. Um, so I'm going to take this last question, although I can see there's been already a few put on the chat. So I'll go through those now. I'll just go to this one because it seems really interesting by Andrew Miles. Question for any speaker. So either of you two can, can come in on this or both of you like. Uh, what are the reasons to expect that Luis Arce will not be Bolivia's Lenin Moreno? And obviously what they mean by that is kind of, um, what is it, a sheep in wolf's clothing, as Correa called him. Um, do you know, somebody who claims to be of the left, to be a kind of, you know, successor to a leftist leader and then who, you know, totally uh, does a 180 kind of a U-turn um, on what they've promised and, um, you know, and is proven to be not what they said so how you know is there any reason to think i'd say is going to do this is there any you know uh, can we be you know confident that he's going to kind of continue um kind of a leftist socialist um project what are your thoughts on that mm. For either of you two can come in. maybe if we know where he's come from really what's his background um olivia do you want to come in on that yeah, well, I mean, I, I certainly, I don't expect he will become the new Lenin Moreno. Um, so Arce was the economy minister under Morales, in the Morales years. And uh, he's a UK trained economist. He's quite, um, he's quite a moderate face, I think, in the, in the party. And I think he was chosen precisely because he, um, because I think he, they, he was perceived to have, be perhaps ideal for bringing back in kind of middle class votes. Also, the fact that, um, and maybe this is only in more recent months of this, but the the kind of you know he's a steady hand. He's he he oversaw the the steady growth and the you know economic growth of Morales years. He which so that places him you know kind of he's well placed to therefore steer the Bolivian economy through what is likely to be quite a difficult time. Right. Um, I don't think he'll become the next Moreno because. The masses, I mean, we're talking about a different set of circumstances here. And I think the, the what's happened over the past year is the social movements, which as we talked about, you know, are kind of the basis of, of the mass, have really gone through the, a reinvigoration. And I think it is, I don't think it's, he's in a position to do that, even if he, if he, if he wanted to. I think that the party is kind of tightly linked and, and, and in many ways quite controlled. Um, so, so that's why I don't foresee that happening. Do you think that's again maybe what Ollie was talking about the strength of the Bolivian social movements are kind of more well organized um, in order to kind of hold their leader to account maybe is that maybe the difference between Ecuador and Bolivia at this particular conjuncture where you see a transition I don't I don't know I don't know Dennis what do you think about that will will I'd say prove to be you know another Lenin Moreno we all celebrate mm. at the time and then we're sorely disappointed I think it's extremely unlikely we're going to see Arce do, do a Lenin Moreno. Most, and the reason number one is because uh, Luis Arce was, uh, was part of Evo Morales' government for much longer and in a, in a much uh, sort of a stronger, much more important position than Lenin Moreno ever was in, 
in case in case of Rafael Correa's uh, government. So we have to remember that Luis Arce is the, the architect of Bolivia's uh, economic system. I said he is. Um, when it comes when it comes to the major the majority of you know the social programs that were implemented under the government of of, of Evo Morales, you know the the, the nationalizations, uh, uh, the creation of new new mass projects, industrialization of lithium, expropriation of of lithium reserves, uh, the teleferical the project, the tram uh, projects in 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 Cochabamba in uh, the infrastructure projects, all of these, all of these uh, were basically effectively designed and proved by Luis Arce Catacora. Uh, so, uh, he, so uh, him, sort of, in, in a way, sort of turning uh, turning neoliberal would be completely nonsensical, as he would be undoing the uh, his uh, the work that he spent thirteen years uh, trying to build. But more on the point that you made, Rachel, about the social movements, that's certainly also also true. And we have to remember that uh, uh, the vice president, uh, the new vice president of, of Bolivia, uh, David Turkey Wanko himself, has has a very has, has a very strong backing from uh, from social movements, from the traditional uh, kind of uh, rural rural peasant and uh, workers communities uh, throughout uh, throughout Bolivia, and he. I believe there is uh, one of one of his main roles in the presidency would actually be to ensure that that uh, uh, that Luis, uh, just kind of the steer the steer, steer the course towards um, towards socialism, uh, but also more importantly to ensure um, to at times also also relieve the pressure which Luis Arce f would feel uh, that it would be coming that would definitely be coming from big business groups, you know. Uh, the land owning elite of of Santa Cruz, but also from the uh, uh, you know the the, bourgeois, the bourgeoisie in, in the in the western region. Uh, so is in the west, he in the western region, seen as kind of the voice of the social movements, I guess, in a way. He is, but uh, uh, but uh, it's it's interesting. It's fascinating how how little Chucky Wonka has actually been able, how little sort of space and how little attention has actually been given, uh, even mm. though Chucky Wonka himself is an intellectual. As a, he said, he's not simply. He wasn't just simply put there as a, as you know, as, as the indigenous face for for the for the uh, for the mass campaign. He is a he's a very well respected philosopher. In, but, uh, within mass, he is he's actually was he's actually I would say the the main ideologue of mass when it comes to uh, actually trying to bring together different currents that made up that make up the organization the 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 Qatarist, Traditions, the um, uh, the sort of the we call the Indian the Indianist movements, but but, but also the, the philosophy of uh, Soma Kamania or uh, or the, or the good, li good, li good living, together with sort of the more Marxist uh, currents. So, uh, Chukwanka really is the ideological glue that holds uh, a lot of these uh, views together in the new government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's true what you're saying. I've, I've only read a little bit on him, but he seemed very interesting um figure i'm sorry if i'm not looking both of you in the eye but i'm trying to make my way through this huge commentary in the chat to um, weed out some questions so um i've got one from somebody called ian drummond who said adriana salvatiera has come to the fore in recent months can speakers expand on this please please to hear as found her very impressive when i first became aware of her around the, the time of last year's election and since she was last in line before Agnes, how different it could have been if she hadn't been forced to resign. So, I mean, you can both come on on this when I have a feeling that this is not, you know. Um, has she taken a more ambiguous combative line than Eva Coppa? Um, do either of you two want to come back on that? Who is Adriana Salvatiera? She's come to the fore in recent months. Yeah, I mean, so she was the former Senate president and she resigned in the wake of the coup and that leave, left this kind of vacuum uh, in which then Janine Anya sort of manoeuvred herself and, and kind of without a quorum declared herself president. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, so I think the, with the point about Eva Copper, so Eva Copper, I think, is also someone who initially came from this sort of, uh, she was quite a marginal figure. And certainly I think 
probably maybe to the right of the party. But in recent months, I think she's really, she, she's actually kind of emerged to be an effective uh, kind of challenge to the coup regime, actually. Um, and she's really steered the, the kind of um, the legislature through what has been a very, very difficult time. Um, but I guess when I was referring to the kind of new, the emergence of these new figures, I think it's, it's the space that has opened up. I mean, obviously the, the party went through a period of crisis and I think we've seen these kind of new leaders like Eva Copper, who I think, yeah, has kind of really, I think, come into her own. Um, and I think she's tipped now to potentially be a new mayor of El Alto. Um, yeah, so I think it's been an interesting sort of process over the past year for the party. Um, but Adriana Salvatierra resigned. Um, from, she was president. I don't know if there's many, maybe more to add on that. I um, I had uh, I had several meetings with uh, with, the, with Adriana when I was when I was in Bolivia, and I've interviewed her uh, several times. She. I would, say, I would say she, together with Andronico or Rodriguez, are both kind of quite interesting figures because uh, Adriana, by her by profession, she's a politologist. So she is. Um, so so she she's she's someone who has actually been who's been trained, um, uh, specifically at um, in understanding the, the the political situation in the country. And she was she was she was one of the main sort of new uh, leadership caters. Uh, of mass. Now, uh, during uh, during the, the recent interview that I did uh, with her, one of um, um, that uh, she she's not she, uh, as uh, Olivia mentioned she's no longer uh, yeah, no longer the president of the Senate, but also but also she's no longer a senator, so she was not actually elected to any uh, to any of office. In these in these current elections, and she mentioned she also she mentioned in the interview that she will not be taking any uh, kind of vice vice ministerial or ministerial posts either. However, what's what is significant is that she still maintains her role as a leader of uh, Columna Sur, which is a youth um, uh, militant uh, militant movement that's uh, that's that's part of Math Math. Uh, Adriana is also uh, also also comes from uh, the region of Santa Cruz. So, which is quite quite significant. Right. And she was uh, she was instrumental in in actually helping to run the campaign of mass in that uh, in that particular reason, uh, region. So I believe that her role her role in the future is actually going to be precisely in that in uh, helping helping to build uh, new cadres, new youth leadership uh, in mass. She uh, sounds right, right across the board. A Laura Pidcock figure. Do you know maybe perhaps somebody who hasn't been uh, elected, who's been quite charismatic and vocal and you know yeah. is organizing the youth but not been elected you know to to any office i don't know what you're... yeah yeah i would say so or oh, alexander ocasio cortez but with mm. better, much better politics <laughs> yeah, we're understanding of foreign policies a little bit better but... yeah 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 because yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, adriana adriana comes from a um let's say Basically, she comes from from Marxist tradition, so mm -hmm. she's someone. So she is someone who is fully supported the Bolivarian Revolution in Venezuela, the Cuban Revolution, of course, the Sandinista Revolution, but all of the, the all of the processes um, of change that have been taking place mm -hmm. across Latin America. There's, there's a lot of text for me to kind of get through in the chat. So if I've missed your question, please feel to retype it. We did have one about the role of the OAS, because as we know, the OAS was um, the organization of uh, American states was really instrumental in kind of drumming up the support for the coup, um, you know, kind of giving um, legitimacy to claims that have been this widespread fraud. You know, um, there has been some, there's been like a call you know, to, uh, for Almagro um, to face, um, Luis Almagro, who's the head of the OAS, to, to face, um, you know, some kind of consequences for this. I'm not quite sure what they'd be, but what, what do you think there? Is there any way, will he be held to, to account? How, how do you think Bolivia will, now that, the, again, the mass is back in government, will there be any movement there to, um, to try and hold the OAS to account for the role that it played in the coup, or at least legitimising the coup? Um, in that sense. 
Well, I mean, unfortunately, no. And I mean, I think this just represents that what the OAS has, off, has served to do in, with successive regimes in Latin America, in Honduras, in Bolivia, it's, it serves to uphold, I think, right, right wing interests, but also it's heavily influenced by the US. Evo Morales in, uh, in Argentina recently, I think yeah, made, he's called for charges to be brought and he said uh, the blood of, of Bolivians is, you know, is um, I'm paraphrasing, but it's, you know, it's the blood of Bolivians because of, of how the OAS uh, and Luis Almagro, how they behaved in Bolivia. Um, and I mean, of course, and yeah, I mean, as you've said, this, they were instrumental, I think, um, really encouraging popular protest at a very, very tense time back in 2019, when they issued this report that has since been debunked about, you know, so-called irregularities in the vote that has since been totally uh, kind of debunked. Um, but I don't think they will face any charges and I don't think we will see this um, actually any justice kind of brought for this, unfortunately. Um, and I think this is, serves, this is a function of what the OAS serves to do and it's why the left, I think, really needs to challenge the power and the, the enduring influence that the OAS holds across um, governments in, in, in Latin America. Is it perhaps, even if there'll be no direct consequences, Dennis, do you think it's another nail in the coffin because the OAS has been so, I mean, especially in its attitude towards Venezuela, it's been so kind of, um, you know, it's lost so much legitimacy, I think, and become such an obvious political uh, tool of the right um, in the region. Is this another, you know, just to have, to have cried fraud, to have had this report that's since been debunked, like Olivia says, and then for the mass to then win with like 25% of the vote, how viable is it for the OAS to, to continue as, you know, a kind of a, a respected, you know, regional organisation, if it is still respected in that sense? Well, I mean, I think I think the role of the OAS was uh, was exposed, you know, years or even decades before when it was called uh, the Ministry of the Colonies uh, mm. by by Fidel, by Fidel Castro. Uh, but what what, was, what we've witnessed, what has actually what, what has happened um, in the case of Bolivia, I think I think it really did uh, kind of really did shake uh, the what do you call it, whatever whatever integrity that. Always appeared to have um, at least among the among the population among the among the countries. Um, I say outside of uh, outside, outside of the left bloc, because um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, like you mentioned, this is uh, this is also the, the first this is also the first time where you know the the claim uh, the claims consistent claims made by Almagro and by OS that lasted for more, for more for more than a year were just broken so suddenly and so and in such a in, and it's such a shocking matter uh, for that uh, for them uh, that you know that now it's it's impossible it will be impossible to doubt uh, the uh, the, uh, the function of the OES when it comes to electoral processes is effectively to to intervene on the side of uh, political organizations that favor uh, the foreign policy of the United States. So, yeah, so whichever uh, in every single sub subsequent electoral processes process, uh, whenever the OES observers are part of the a part of the mission, you know, whatever they say, I believe, would be far more scrutinized than it has been uh, before. Uh, but but uh, with, with this regards, you know, with the, will the will the Almagro be you know sued? Will be he forced to resign? The OAS will, will, could it be abolished? I would say, uh, yeah, probably, uh, probably unlikely. As you know, as the uh, as long as the United States still maintains uh, main support of the organization, but but uh, I'd say the authority of the OAS will definitely be um, you know, says, uh, will definitely be uh, undermined, especially especially if the projects of CELAC uh, is is still maintained. Through the support, mm -hmm. through the help of Mexico, if the project of, of UNASUR is resurrected uh, with the help of Bolivia and uh, Argentina, if the project of, of ALBA still uh, maintains itself mm -hmm. for the foreseeable future, you know, while while all these three main uh, organizations uh, maintain themselves as alternatives, I would say the the, the power or, or of the OES will continue to decrease. Way. Hmm. Well, I've got another question here from another Roberto who's uh, asking about insights into the controversy over the two thirds rule. And you might need to explain what the two thirds rule is. Yeah, I think 
before. If you're I think what this is referring to, I, I would, yeah, I, I think I would really push back on this. If I'm, if if Roberto is referring to what I'm thinking of, I would not say there's a huge controversy over this. So I think what this is referring to is the fact that this week the um, the outgoing legislature. Um, controlled by the mass, uh, has changed uh, the requirement to have a two-thirds majority in the Senate for, uh, I think it's 11 sort of appointment procedures. So obviously they've done this because in the Senate, this time around, the mass won't have a two-thirds majority. They have a simple majority. So that's what I think. So they've changed the requirement of a two-thirds majority. However, the reason why this really isn't a big deal is because these appointments relate to um, there, so it's like the promotion of the police chief, it's ambassadorial appointments. So we're not talking about any major constitutional change here. It's in fact quite a routine sort of change. And yes, they've done it because they want to be able to pass with a simple majority in the next legislature, but it doesn't have any major impact on policy making. It doesn't have any major constitutional impact. Just, uh, Dennis, do you have anything you wanted to add to that? I would say that uh, the main focus of this, um, well, of, of, first off, is that yeah, the, the main uh, reason for changing the um, the two thirds majority rule is to is actually to ensure that you know what, one one they would able to be able to remove the uh, members of the armed forces and the police forces uh, that were appointed during the uh, the time the period of of the Anis regime, to and two to also be able to uh, persecute. Uh, prosecute them for the crimes that they committed uh, during the massacres in Sankara and, and Sakawa and throughout this whole uh, this whole period of, period of time. And this really is sort of uh, sort of the core, the, re uh, the main the main reason for the, uh, for the change that was made. However, however, the the threats, however, the 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 right has very much now picked up on this. On, on on this issue, and they, and if it's it's something that they're once again trying to use as, as some kind of glue to to try to stick together or to uh, to still be um, on the message. And this is this is something I believe we should not underestimate. There's something that we've learned from uh, the protests uh, last year, from the campaigns that are waged by the by the right and, and the far right uh, last year. You know, through their through their use of social media, through the use of uh, private media through the way they conduct protests is that from now on from now on any 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 kind of a campaign where it's uh, where the right attempts to you know portray mass as being a, 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 in any way authoritarian or if it tries to portray you know just uh, just create a false falsehoods it is it's important to constantly to, to, to constantly debunk mm -hmm. uh, their, their, their theories and uh, uh, to demonstrate the reality of the situation. And the reality of the situation is that the protests that are currently taking place in Bolivia against this so-called two-thirds uh, rule is actually these are actually protests uh, for for impunity of the crimes that have been committed by the INS regime and by the military uh, leaders of that, so the, of that regime. So the kind of um, kind of consequences maybe for the coup leaders that we can expect to see. Then there will be some attempt to prosecute. Um, police chiefs and is there anybody else do you think will there be any politicians that that will be um, prosecuted for their role in the coup or what what's what do we think is going to happen there in terms of that well, well the um, the committee uh, it was called it's called the mixed committee uh, sorry, I don't know I don't remember the full name but it was it was established uh, in the assembly and in the senate uh, with regards to overviewing the overviewing the, the human rights abuses that there has already already has plans to prosecute Anya's and 11 of her, of her ministers former ministers uh, for the uh, for, for crimes against humanity uh, so that's that that, that is that's that is already uh, uh, that, that has already started it's already ongoing um this uh, but the list is likely to be very uh, much longer than this because we are also talking about uh, the, the the list of um, as, I say, as I said the military officers uh, who were appointed during her time the police chiefs who were part of the mutiny in November uh, last year the different leaders of the so-called civic committees Oli 
I mentioned before in Santa Cruz and in other and other places. Uh, it's hard to say. It's hard to say if uh, Carlos Mesa would also be um, would also be one of the names mentioned, as he did not he did not explicitly take part in any, any of the violent actions that have uh, that have that have taken place in the last year. So he may be one of the few kind of. Uh, uh, how to say this? He might be one of the few who who, who, who could be spared in this in this in this process of of cleaning up. Uh, we'll see a lot of asylum um, applications to the United States, perhaps. Yes. Um, well, 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 the, well, well, the Anya's government they are allegedly applied for three hundred and fifty tourist visas to to the United States for her, her right, and her, okay. the members of her government. Okay. Um, and I think this is going to be our last question now. Do, do, do. Repeat question. What chance does this result have of repeating in Ecuador early next year? Olivia, do you have any thoughts on that at all? Can we expect a different dynamic, you know, in Ecuador? Yeah, I, I, I will say I'm not sure I'm best qualified to comment on, on the Ecuadorian situation. Um, so I'll I'll leave that one because I don't want to to wade in on, on something I'm not so sure about. But um, yeah, yeah, I don't know, no. Dennis, you might have something. What do sure, you think? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. I've kind of been observing the the current situation as much as uh, the Bolivian one. Uh, it's it's complicated. It's a, it's more complicated uh, scenario. Uh, mostly because there are a lot more political actors in play uh, in Ecuador. Um, the at the moment at, uh, at the moment it is impossible to predict uh, the, uh, the results uh, in Ecuador. Is uh, I mean according to the polls, according to the polls, uh, the right the main right wing candidate Guillermo Lasso is ahead with you know anywhere between twenty eight percent and thirty two percent, and the main candidate of the Citizens Revolution, or Andres Arauz, is uh, is just just slightly behind with a few uh, a few points behind. Um, and there's there's also the um, uh, the candidate of the of the party of Pachacutic, uh, which traditionally was the political arm of the Konaya movement of the indigenous uh, of the Confederation of Indigenous Nations of Ecuador. But again, this is a this is a figure this, uh, this is a figure that uh, often uh, that's very sort of often violently opposed the government of Rafael Correa and also also many many times supported the candidates. Of the right. Mm -hmm. However, however, it's important to uh, to remember that uh, if any any single avenue, any single attempt to try to stop the the candidacy of of the Citizens Revolution being present in these elections, every single attempt at it has been foiled, thankfully, uh, by the. Um, by the coalition, by the uh, citizens' revolution, by its uh, allies, by the coalition, and this is this is a process which has been dragged on, on and on and on, uh, constantly. So, first, first Rafael Correa's um, can, uh, candidacies uh, was, was revoked, or his vice presidential uh, candidacy was was revoked. Then the candidacy of Andres Arauz and the new candidate Carlos Rabascal was was under threat. Time and time and time, uh, time again. It's, it's hard to think of any other, uh, other electoral process where, they, where this is something like this has taken place. So, the level of desperation that there is to avoid a victory of uh, of Arauz and Citizens Revolution actually, I, I feel like it helps to illustrate the real picture on the ground, and that is the support, the support which uh, uh, they still have. Uh, so Korea, uh, Korea, his 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 movement, his image, together with. Um, together with the, that of his allies, is quite likely to be a to be a majority. Yeah, so I yes, so yes, I do I do think that could it be as you know as sort of as shocking as as, as astounding yeah. as the one in Bolivia? Um, hard to tell, hard to tell. But it definitely no. But what happened in Bolivia will really sort of uh, uh, put the, the wind in the sails of uh, the citizens' revolution in Ecuador, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. well, it'd be really interesting to see kind of what 
direction the you know the mass government takes now what its priorities are um you know what it does with this huge mandate that it's got so i'm sure we'll have you both back on sooner rather than later to discuss that and hopefully as ollie said earlier you know we don't see kind of the expansion of this the this kind of what's been up until now localized violence as, as i've understood it um hopefully we don't see that but yeah thanks so much to the both of you for joining us it's been really insightful for me and i'm sure it's been really um insightful for everybody at home as well um sorry we've lost ollie but i'll pass on his th uh, everyone's thanks to him as well for appearing um uh so yeah it's just been a really really great talk and i'm glad it's been recorded so um anyone who's missed it will be able to watch it back i'm just going to draw people's attention to an event that we've got on the 22nd of uh november uh, it's going to be on cuba and we've got the author helen yaffe she's going to be talking about her new book so that's one to put in your calendars so watch our uh, facebook twitter pages and websites um if you want to sign up uh, for that, I think it should be going on there tomorrow. Um, so tune in if that sounds interesting uh, to you at all. Um, everyone who's participated, please share our events. We're trying to do more and more and more. It's a hugely turbulent, interesting, amazing time for Latin America right now. Um, you know, we've got elections coming up in Venezuela and like um, one of our um, listeners mentioned we've got elections coming up in ecuador a new kind of leftist government in mexico um so you know there's lots going on and we want to do our best to cover it all so you know if you can please feel free to you know just attend for free we want our events to be open to everyone but if you can uh, you know just donate the odd five pounds it really helps us to do things like pay for our zoom accounts um last time when we had a an event on colombia we had um fox senator um victoria sandino she spoke we were able to pay for translation a live translation so that could um so people could understand us so if you can you know and you know it's a very hard time for people right now the pandemic um it's very worrying and you know it's not the easiest of times but if you do have a few pounds to throw them throw them our way we'd be very grateful for them um but yeah just once more thank you to our speakers and uh, thank you to all of our listeners who who came um and yeah put the 22nd in your diary if you would like to join for that i'm gonna sign off but thanks dennis and thanks olivia uh, for joining us mm -hmm.